All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Todd Eckenstam. I work in the Kubernetes platform team at Intuit, and I'll be talking about building resilient services on Kubernetes. One big question uh, often on people's minds is, can I really build mission critical applications on Kubernetes? Uh, yes, yes, you can. Uh, uh, and it, you know, it's really possible to eliminate a lot of the infrastructure related issues you find and build highly resilient and, and uh, available systems. So let me quickly cover the agenda for this talk. Uh, I'll start with the background of Intuit and its infrastructure at a glance. Uh, then I'll talk uh, briefly about client resiliency patterns and resilient architecture. And then since it's critical to understanding the rest of the material, I'll give a quick review of the pod lifecycle. Then I'll jump into readiness gates for applications and load balancers. And then we'll talk about how pods are terminated in Kubernetes and what to watch out for. I'll also address some considerations for pod startup and uh, how we use pod disruption budgets to protect our applications uh, from disruptions. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with some takeaways and some uh, Q&A. Uh, so Intuit's a global FinTech company that builds several financial products and services, including TurboTax, Credit Karma, QuickBooks, and MailChimp. In fact, if you use TurboTax for tax prep or QuickBooks for accounting, and payroll, you might be interested to know that they're running on Kubernetes, uh, on the Kubernetes-based platform that my team maintains. Uh, the numbers here s uh, highlight the scale of the platform that we have. Uh, we support around 300 clusters, supporting over 2,500 services. And the content of this talk really is as a result of running critical systems on Kubernetes at scale uh, over the past five years. So first, let's talk about client resiliency and resilient architecture. So it's important to note that resiliency really starts with the application code itself. With distributed systems, things can and will go wrong. Uh, proper error handling and use of these resiliency patterns is critical. Uh, so it's really beyond the scope of this talk to cover all these in detail, but I just want to call out that it's really, it starts with the code. Uh, then the other part is understanding your service and what other services uh, it depends on is also very important. At Intuit, we use this kind of tiering approach uh, where some services are more important to our business than others. And that means some have higher expectations for availability and reliability than others. Uh, so let's take a look at a hypothetical system here. So here we see uh, we've defined the dependencies of the system and we've defined the tiering um, but what if there's a problem with this tier three service? Uh, if it also causes user visible errors in the tier one services, then that means it's really not a tier three service to begin with. Uh, so it should really be considered a tier one service. And so, hey, you know, I know Visio. I can, uh, you know, let me update the graph. Okay, now let's just, okay, problem solved, right? We'll just update the diagram, make everything tier one, right? Problem solved. Now what happens? So the problem is with tier one services, there's typically a higher HA and DR requirement and also lower operational metric targets, you know, like mean time to recovery, uh, stricter data recovery objectives like uh, RPO and, and uh, RTO, which makes declaring everything tier one very expensive as well as not being very realistic. Okay, so let's go back and edit our graph again. So the architect says, okay, no problem. Uh, what's really needed is to put in some various techniques to decouple different services from each other uh, so that different tiers don't depend on lower tier. You know, higher tiers don't depend strictly on, on lower tiers. And this is really what helps you build a resilient architecture. So maybe you add logic to your tier one service to ride through errors uh, with the tier one or tier two service. You, know, you can gracefully degrade the, the experience for your users. Or maybe you use an event-based architecture where you can. Uh, or maybe some services don't really even need to be in the call stack to begin with for a tier one service. Uh, you can convert them to some kind of offline job. Uh, so that way, um, when there's an error in one service, it really doesn't bring, home, uh, bring down the whole system. 
The previous example is based on a very simplistic architecture. Uh, you might you know, be using some other types of architecture like hexagonal uh, architecture, which gives kind of a good way of thinking about inputs and outputs of an application. But it doesn't like fully solve the problem in and of itself. Then when you start putting these applications together into a system, you still have all these interactions between the different uh, applications. And so it, the point at which um, whatever architecture you're using, when it's implemented, you need to ensure that it provides resiliency and isolation for those interactions. So, so far I haven't really mentioned much about Kubernetes. <laughs> so let's dive in and look at a quick review of the pod lifecycle since that's where many of the resiliency tools and techniques of Kubernetes really come into play. Uh, so here we are with a pod. It might be composed of an application container and maybe a sidecar. And the sum of the resource requests for all those containers in the pod adds up to one CPU and, and two gigs of RAM. Um, and so now at this point, the pod is in pending state and, and not ready to receive traffic. And really, it's, it really only exists as a desired state uh, recorded in the control plane at CD database. It doesn't really even exist as compute resources at this point. Um, so then what happens next is the Kubernetes scheduler in the control plane will look at those total pod requests and see where does that pod best fit on all my nodes. And then it determines which node would be best to run and uh, the pod's metadata in etcd is updated to, uh, you know, with the selected node. So meanwhile, the kubelet on the node finds out that it's responsible for running a new pod. So it transitions the pod to creating state, and then it pulls the images for all the containers of the pod down from the image registry and runs the pod using the container runtime, you know, either container D, Docker, or something like that. Uh, and now the pod is running, but it's still in not ready state to receive traffic. Maybe the app still needs to load the libraries that it depends on. It might need to download configuration, uh, establish database connections, or some other kind of startup operation. Uh, this can take some time, but the application code is responsible to respond to the readiness endpoint with 200 OK once it's really ready to accept the incoming requests. So once it does that, the pod is running and ready to accept traffic. There's also some other lifecycle hooks that you can use to customize the, the pod lifecycle. So that seems complex enough, but now let's talk about readiness gates and load balancers. So remember, there's all that uh, process of becoming, you know, starting the pod, having the pod become ready. And now you need to uh, expose it outside your cluster to receive outside traffic. Uh, so let's look at the ingress traffic flow into the pods. So here we see a pretty normal namespace with three pods and a service. So let's assume these pods have already gone through the pod startup life, life cycle and are ready. Uh, but now we want to expose the application outside the cluster. So we create an ingress object. And if you're running on a cloud provider like AWS, you need to create the, the cloud resources required to support that ingress object. And this is typically done, the responsibility of a controller uh, that will create the load balancer and, uh, and, the, and add the IP addresses of the pods into the, um, the target group of the load balancer. So once this is all set up, the, the traffic can come into the ALB and will be directed to the set of pods. This is great, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, pods can be deleted and recreated at any time. Uh, so the controller needs to not only create the ALB and the target group, but it also needs to kind of manage the membership of the target group uh, as pods in the application come and go. This is where the concept of a readiness gate comes into play. The readiness gate prevents unregistering of old pods from the ALB target group before new pods are fully registered and healthy. Uh, so it's, it's a, an extension of the readiness concept. So at least with AWS, you enable readiness gates by adding the pod readiness gate inject label into the namespace. And this is another important component 
of maintaining resiliency and, and preventing uh, 500 errors uh, when you're adding and removing pods from your load balancers. And I'm gonna skip this slide. This is what I basically just said. It's more for the, the PDF. Uh, so let's look at some common problems and solutions. Uh, so first, you might see that pods are not in ready state and new pods might never become ready. Uh, usually this means that there's something wrong with either the, the readiness probe or there's some actual app issue. So if you're seeing the symptom, uh, that, that's what I'd suggest looking at. Uh, the other possibility is that your pods are restarting unexpectedly um, and or the pod is maybe in a crash loop back off. And so you, this sometimes is related to the liveliness probes or maybe you have a, a memory leak, um, something like that, um, which would cause an oomph kill and, and repeated uh, restarting that way. Um, so you'd wanna inspect your container logs and, and you know, debug and fix your application. Another common problem you might run into is high latency for requests to new pods. Uh, so especially if you're trying to debug some performance issues and you notice, hey, it's always the new pods that are slow. Um, so then a lot of times that could be a lack of pre-warming of the application. Um, and this is particularly prevalent with Java applications where they take a while to start up and you know, fully get all their code running and, and, up, and uh, or you might have other issues and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, so you could try pre-warming the application or use what's called the slow start feature in your, in your networking stack or uh, in your service mesh or in your load balancer. And uh, we'll mention this a little bit in a future slide. You might also see uh, pods flapping between being ready and not ready, and maybe coming in and out of the ALB target groups. And we've seen this happen a lot with gate rush, gate rush situations where there's just too much traffic. And so a lot of times there'll be a gate rush, the new pods will, will suddenly get a bunch of traffic, they're not able to handle it, maybe even their thread pool gets exhausted. And then when the thread pool gets exhausted, the, the app, the, the container can't even respond to the, the readiness check. So the readiness check will start timing out and then it'll come out of, it'll be taken out of the load balancer. Some requests will process and drain, then the readiness check will succeed, but then the gate rush will hit it again and it'll just keep, that cycle will keep repeating. Uh, so if you see that behavior, then you know, look at how you can prevent that gate rush situation. Okay, now let's talk about pod terminations. So have you ever really, have you ever gotten a call from an application developer who is debugging a 500 error and, and that's returned to their client and they might be saying, hey, there's no problem in the app, but for some reason Kubernetes is returning the 500. Uh, maybe they've done some troubleshooting and they say, hey, it looks like the 500 happened when Kubernetes terminated my pod. Uh, why did my pod get terminated? You know, that, it should never terminate my pod once I run it. Uh, but the reality is with Kubernetes, there's lots of normal operations that will cause pods and nodes to go down. Uh, most sim simple one is when you're doing a new application rollout. So when you're, if the system is running, you're deploying a new application, the old pods are still service, servicing traffic, they're gonna get replaced by the old pods. Those, uh, those old, they're gonna be replaced by the new pods. The old pods need to um, you know, terminate their processing exit and then let the, uh, the new pods take over. You could also have applications scale up uh, or scale down. So when your application is scaling down, it, it no longer needs as many pods as HPA uh, originally allocated. So those pods will get terminated. Also cluster upgrades. If you need to upgrade to a new Kubernetes version, maybe roll out some OS uh, patches or security patches for your, your nodes, then you'll need to go through and, and uh, essentially terminate and restart all your nodes in your cluster. And when that happens, all the pods in that node are gonna be terminated and then rescheduled onto a different node. And then there's also a cluster scale down where uh, 
Previously, you needed 100 nodes. Now you're, you have a few nodes that are sparsely utilized. So Kubernetes may evict some of those pods, reschedule them on, you know, bin pack them onto another node, and then terminate the node. And that, you know, that'll, you know, reduce the total number of your, your nodes, but it may cause some pods to get temporarily terminated and reshuffled. And so all these things are normal things that happen. So, um, you know, we have to account for pods being terminated and make sure they can be done in a way that uh, doesn't impact the, op the operation of the system. Uh, so as a service owner, you should expect that your pods will go down and account for that. Um, but how do we really ensure uh, resiliency in the face of pods being terminated? So when a pod is terminated, um, Kubernetes performs a series of, of steps. So first it sets the pod to terminating state, and then it rem and removes all the, you know, re removes the IP address of the pod from all the endpoints uh, for the services. Then it'll call the pre-stop hook for the pod uh, if, it's been, if it's been configured. And then a SIG term is sent to the pod. At that point, the application should start its graceful shutdown process. Um, Kubernetes will wait for some kind of grace period. Uh, the default is 30 seconds, but you can configure that differently. And then after that grace period, if the pod is still running, it'll send a SIG kill. So it'll, it'll hard stop the, the process. And then after that, the pod is deleted. So the ideal case is the application should get a SIG term, it should clean up its, its pending requests, and then it should intentionally exit, right? So uh, uh, Kubelet should never have to really send a SIG kill, uh, ideally. So let's look how this plays out and what are some of the the resiliency issues that can come around. So here, let's take an example of an ungraceful shutdown. So this is a kind of the best case scenario for an ungraceful shutdown. So when I say ungraceful shutdown, that means this is an application that's not listening for SIG term. It's just processing. Uh, so what happens is uh, you delete the pod, the API server will uh, sort of in parallel, it'll call the endpoint controller to remove the IP address from the services and uh, you know, take that pod out of rotation. But, in, but at the same time, it contacts, you know, Kubelet also finds out about this and will send the SIG term request. And once it does that, it starts the, the terminating uh, grace period timeout. Uh, in this case, the IP is taken out of rotation uh, pretty quickly, but then the app never never terminates. But at some point, the app doesn't have any incoming requests anymore anyway. So it's really, it's okay. You know, it's, it's not ideal, but eventually it'll get a SIG kill and it'll terminate. And But there's no 500s in this case. But now let's take a case where it's really, the system's under stress. You have a heavily loaded node. Everything's running just a little bit slower, right? So. All, these are all the same lines as with the previous graph. They're just a little bit longer. Um, and so in particular, it might, you know, to update your IP tables, it might, you know, we've seen that that sometimes takes uh, a long time. Also, Kube proxy also can take a long time uh, under kind of under load and under stress. And so when this happens, this is where this ungraceful shutdown falls apart because what happens is now, uh, after 30 seconds, the application, the, the kubelet will send a SIG kill to the application and hard stop it. But the IP address is still being used to service traffic. And so when this happens, that's, you'll get a 500 error. Uh, so that's, uh, that's another thing that has to be dealt with. Uh, so ideally, so now you say, okay, I'll, I'm gonna handle SIG term. Uh, so let's take this naive case where I just get the SIG term and I immediately exit my application. So what happens there? Um, so here, now we're back to sort of an optimal situation where, uh, you know, we, we terminate, but there's two things gonna happen. One is we're still terminating before the IP addresses have been removed from rotation. 
Also, any pending requests that are you know, being actively serviced by other threads, those are going to immediately just all give 500s, right? So this, so even though yes, they're handling the SIG term, they're doing it in a very naive way and just exiting. Uh, you don't want to do that. Um, so you could sort of maybe f work around this problem. Uh, you can use the pre-stop hook and you can say, well, I know the timeout of my ALB is this many seconds and my keep alive is this many seconds. Uh, you can configure this pre-stop hook to sort of make up for this. And in this case, it's, it works out okay. You, you end up terminate, you extend the termination of the node or of the uh, application container long enough so that the IPs will be taken out of rotation. Now, still it doesn't account for in-flight requests that maybe are still being processed by the threads. Uh, so you'd want to you know, wait long enough so that all those would, be a, would have been processed. So this is kind of a workaround, but it's still not that great, right? What you, what you really want is you do want a graceful shutdown, a true graceful shutdown. And what does a true graceful shutdown look like? Uh, you know, first you can just you can just wait, right? You can wait for uh, and and just keep processing requests. Um, but but then you're kind of depending on the IP tables finally getting updated and not getting any more requests. You could start responding with you could set your your readiness to false. So you could say, I'm not ready. I'm about to shut down. I don't want to take any more traffic. That's probably the best way. Uh, or you could start responding with, you know, retriable errors back to your, your clients. Um, uh, but, but I think also you'd want to really just wait for all the in-flight requests to, to drain and finish uh, processing before exiting. And so that way, if you do that, if you do the third option, um, you really minimize the window. So you shut down almost as fast as you can, uh, but, you're, but uh, you want to keep processing requests and, um, until uh, they're all drained out. And so, you know, how do you do this? Um, so for Spring Boot, there's an option for server shutdown equals graceful. Uh, so if you're using Java Spring Boot, you can, you can configure that. Uh, what this does is it implements uh, sig term uh, signal handling and then Tomcat and Jetty as part of Spring Boot will stop accepting new requests and then wait for in-flight requests start to be drained. Um, if you're using other languages, you know, depending on the framework, you may have a similar option or worst case, you can implement your own sig term handler. Uh, for both of the, for all of these actually, you want to make sure that your process, your, your container process for your app is uh, a PID1, because uh, Kubelet all, only sends um, the term signal to PID1. Uh, if you have some other kind of wrapper around your application, that wrapper might get the, the term and not your actual application. Um, but, and you know, then you can also, uh, depending on the length of time uh, it takes you to, to gracefully shut down, you might need to extend the termination grace period seconds, if for some reason saving your state takes a long time, you know, more than 30 seconds, uh, then you'd want to extend that time out. Um, if you don't really have control over the code, um, maybe it's a legacy application, then that's where you can maybe think about the, the lifecycle pre-stop hook. And with the pre-stop hook, we, you know, there's another slide about it, uh, but you want to set the, you can basically set the pre-stop hook just to sleep. So all the pre-stop hook would do is sleep and wait for the cooldown period where, uh, where all your um, pending requests would have been processed. So here's an example of the graceful shutdown, kind of what it looks like in the code. Um, so you'd want to drain the in-flight uh, requests, uh, close the databases, uh, save your state, all that kind of good stuff. And this would be done by some type of, uh, you know, shutdown hook that would be triggered by the, the SIG term. And again, you want to make sure your, your app is PID1. Uh, you don't want to use some kind of fork or weight in a wrapper. Um, but if that's not an option, you still have the, the lifecycle pre-stop hook. And this is what that would look like. 
Uh, here we're showing that we're setting the grace termination period seconds to 62 seconds, and that the the pre-stop hook is really sleeping for 60 seconds. So it's, it's, and that 60 seconds is really just to say, hey, after 60 seconds, there really should be no possible way that I have any pending requests, right? That's, and this works, this is okay, but it's gonna make all your deployments slower. It's gonna make scale up and scale down slower. So it's really not desirable. Okay, so let's talk about new pods because we talked about how you know, terminating pods. Uh, so just like how pods must be terminated in a resilient uh, manner, it's, it's also important to introduce new replicas of an application correctly. You know, otherwise you'll have resiliency problems with the new pods. And so usually this all resolves around the pod being sent, uh, either, either sent traffic before it's ready or too much traffic uh, really before it's, it's ready to receive it. And so this can manifest in a number of different problems. Uh, you might get high latency of requests like we talked about earlier uh, due to your cache not being warmed or your, your application itself not being worn, uh, warmed. Um, and again, this, we've, we've seen a lot of this with Java applications. You might get a 504 or some kind of time, uh, client timeout uh, to request for to new pods. Um, you might get uh, race conditions or deadlocks due to too many requests coming at once because you're under heavy load, your HPA is scaling up, you're adding new pods, but then you, you add that new pod and it immediately gets slammed with way too much traffic. Um, uh, or, and that can also lead to the, the last one, which is out of threads. Um, so what are some things you can do? Uh, so first you, you wanna do maybe one or two of the, one or of the following. You wanna do pre-warming of the application. So for Java, you might uh, uh, proactively load all the classes that you need. Uh, you might do pre-cache loading. Um, you might set up all your, your database connections. Another technique you can use is to use a, a pre-start hook to force the warming of your application by actually sending sort of some like no-op requests to your application. And that will spur your application to process those no-op requests and uh, page in the, the stuff that it needs. And then once that finishes, then you can receive the, the real customer traffic. Um, or you can, if, if it's supported with your networking stack, you can use the ALB slow start annotation. Uh, this is a capability, it's in, I think it's in a lot of uh, service mesh as well as, uh, as load balancers. So I think most networking stacks support this concept. And really what this means is that when a new pod is, is added to the, the target group, it'll get a very small amount of traffic initially. And then that percent, so less than its fair share. If you're thinking about, okay, I have 10 pods, or say you have nine pods, and I add a 10th pod, it's gonna not get one tenth of the traffic right away. It'll be maybe a hundredth of the traffic or even less. Um, and then the traffic to those new pods will slowly ramp. Uh, and what that does is maybe those first initial requests are slower because the pod isn't really warmed yet. Um, and it'll have higher latency, but at least uh, it, it minimizes the impact of that so that not all your requests are slow. Um, so yeah, then I also talked about uh, generating synthetic load using the post-start container lifecycle hooks. Uh, that's another way to, to pre-warm the pods. Okay, let's talk about pod disruption budgets. So using a pod disruption budget uh, allows an application to specify how many replicas must remain in service at any given point uh, during voluntary disruptions. And so, and the key here is voluntary disruptions. Uh, this is when you're doing a node drain or you're, you're doing a deployment, all those things that we talked about in the earlier slide. If any of those happen, Kubernetes must respect the PDB and will not take out too many replicas. So. Um, now it doesn't cover things like if, if the actual hardware, if there's a hardware problem and the, and the node unexpectedly crashes or, or what have you. Uh, but for voluntary disruptions, it'll protect you. 
So for instance, uh, this is used during cluster upgrades, which can be uh, disruptive where, you know, there's a lot of nodes that are cordoned and drained and then uh, removed during that process, re resulting in all the pods being evicted and rescheduled. Um, also AZ re rebalancing, uh, that also um, should respect the fact that, okay, I wanna rebalance the nodes across my AZs, but when I'm terminating that node, all the pods, um, it'll still, it won't terminate the pods running on that node until it's uh, satisfied the, the PDBs. But so what are some common problems with PDBs? So one thing that we've seen is either missing or misconfigured PDBs. Uh, and one thing is, you know, the developer might mess up the label, you know, very simple typo, you just, have a label selector that's incorrect and it doesn't really match anything. So now you think you're protected by a PDB, but it just, it's just not, it's not doing anything. Um, we've also seen where there's a PDB configured for an application that's in crash loop back off, or at least maybe one of the pods are in crash loop back off. And I think there's a, a patch to this. I think Kubernetes behavior is gonna change. Uh, so it's not gonna count a crashing pod as a disruption, but um, and this doesn't really impact the resilience of the service itself, other than it's crashing. Um, but having a PDB configured for an application in crash loop back off will block a lot of cluster operations. So if you're trying to do the cluster upgrade, you're trying to you know uh, uh, spin down that node and you know um, bin pack your pods, uh, that you know that PDB can block those kinds of operations. Um, We've also seen PDBs targeting multiple, you know, multiple PDBs targeting the same set of pods. So in other words, you have two PDBs with the same selector, and that's just not a good idea. Um, that's also gonna cause havoc with uh, cluster upgrades and other maintenance activities. So a lot of these things, honestly, PDBs, the problems with PDBs are mainly an impact on the platform teams that are running the, the Kubernetes clusters themselves. Um, because a lot of those operations are gonna be blocked uh, if there's a, a misconfigured PDB. So what are some things that you should do? So one is, you know, if you're, you should create some alerts. Uh, I mean, it's kind of common sense, but create some alerts for pods that are in crash loop back off. And then you should, if there are any, then you should go fix those, especially if those are in production. Um, We've seen a lot of cases where teams are saying, well, you know, we're still under development, the pods are crashing, it's no big deal, it's in pre-prod. And so if that's the case, that's fine, just delete the PDB and, you know, and if, you're, if you don't really even care about it, just delete the, the deployment object itself as well. Um, otherwise, you're just uh, burning resources for no use. Um, but, you, you know, in a production system, you should not have a PDB, you should not have pods persistently in crash loop back off state. Um, so the other one is to make sure the PDB is properly configured with the correct selector and a reasonable max unavailable setting. Um, you know, if you say max unavailable zero, that's not, that's, there's a, there's some very narrow use cases where that's useful. Usually that's related to batch jobs that are running that you know are critical to finish running and you don't want those disrupted. Um, and, and, and you know that it will complete within a certain amount of time. But otherwise, if it's a regular kind of microservice type of application, you don't want to be uh, setting max unavailable to zero. That's, um, that means your pods will never, would never be gracefully evicted. Also in general, I recommend using percentages instead of specific replica counts. You know, if you say, okay, we allow one disruption, two disruptions, you know, then that's good when maybe when you're starting out, but, um, as your application scales and starts taking more traffic and you have more and more pods, uh, if you set your PDBs to use a percentage from the get-go, then that percentage will scale with your application. And then also keep the PDB configuration simple. Uh, don't specify both min available and max unavailable and all these, you know, because technically you can, but it just makes it confusing. Uh, just keep it simple and, and stick to one approach. All right, let's talk about some of the takeaways. Um, so yeah, like we talked uh, talked about in the beginning, uh, use um, 
use some of the common client resiliency patterns. Um, also look at resilient architecture. Uh, really, that's the first step, is making sure your code is resilient. Uh, then it's really important to understand the pod creation and termination lifecycle, because a lot of the issues with the resiliency on Kubernetes are all uh, related to, to either new pods or pods getting terminated. Uh, and recognize that pods can be terminated at any time. Uh, you, know, you need to handle those SIG terms, uh, gracefully shut down, uh, use the termination grace period and the pre-stop hooks when necessary. Um, and then anticipate these gate rush situations because that's another, uh, another big driver of instability is uh, spikes in network traffic, spikes in, in uh, you know, constrained, you know, having a, having a quickly ramping um, deployment where you're going from zero to 60 in a very short time. Uh, those are kinds of things that you need to uh, plan ahead for and, and mitigate. And then lastly, use uh, PDBs to protect your pods. So with that, thank you, appreciate it. And we have some time for a QA. and a Yes. So is sleep before the kill is sent helpful? Or do you, inside it, of that, do you send your own SIG term and then sleep before Kubernetes sends it? Well, you can do a more sophisticated pre-stop hook, you know, for example, and so you could, if you have, if you wanted to, for example, orchestrate the shutdown with other, other systems that you have, right? Say you have a little bit more complicated environment so that pre-stop hook could do other things, right? Um, but in the example that I was giving, it was just kind of just sleeping. Uh, it was what kind of like the default workaround behavior is, is, is asleep for some period of time. And that period of time would essentially delay the time at which your pod is terminated to give more time for the endpoint controller to take out the IP addresses and, and you, know, st you know, stop sending requests. So, so it kind of is delaying the the sig kill. So Kubernetes starts taking the IP out of rotation by the point that it does the pre stop. Right. Okay. Yeah. It, it those two processes happen in parallel, and so some of this kind of comes about because of that. It's a little bit of a race condition where the control plane is trying to remove the IPs, and Kubelet is on the node is trying to terminate the the process and they kind of can race against each other sometimes, especially under like super heavy load. So usually if you're testing small, you know, small volumes and things, you won't ever see this kind of thing. This is happening on peak traffic at the worst possible time, right? And, and also, you know, the reality is a lot of these are, you'll have a, a, a few seconds, maybe a minute where you'll get 500 errors and you'll get a few 500 errors. And maybe for your application, that's not a big deal. Like, who cares? I get some 500 errors, it's not a big deal. At Intuit, you get a 500 error, someone's ringing your phone call, you know, <laughs> ringing your, your, uh, your pager duty to say, hey, why, why did I get a 500 error? Uh, so we, we really look, we try to not have literally any 500 errors, at least um, caused by the infrastructure or application. So it kind of depends on your tolerance for those kinds of errors, because it is a very narrow window. But if you want to absolutely uh, eliminate the possibility for 500 errors, these are the kinds of things you have to worry about. Yeah. Um, first of all, congrats on surviving taxes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about peak loads, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so two things, you know, one is, so we do have a platform team that's managing Kubernetes. And what's super critical is providing the right level of abstraction to the dev team, 
right? Because we found a lot of dev teams, they want to write their Java code. They want to do their business logic. They don't want to worry about PDBs. They don't want to worry about like load balancer configuration and all this stuff. They just want to write their business logic. And so, you know, having the right level of abstraction to begin with so that some of these things are not even exposed to them, right? That's the ideal. Now, that being said, we have, we still have some monoliths at Intuit. And so those monoliths are managed by an SRE team that's, you know, attached to that, that business unit. And they're, they're kind of doing their own thing, not really following as much the, you know, by necessity, right? Because they, they have a different use case. Um, and so some of the times, you know, we'll see problems with, with those teams that, you know, they do, they do things mostly right, but that there's always these little margins where uh, they didn't get it quite right. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think to prevent it, it's about abstraction and providing the right uh, interface to the developers. And then knowing the developers, sometimes developers want, you know, they, they are Kubernetes experts and they want to have this control but a lot of times they don't, right? Even, you know, they just, they just want to focus on the code. Um, I think the other aspect is having some safe defaults. So to prevent it from happening in the, in the first place, you know, having some safe defaults. Um, the other thing is we started this probably uh, five or six years ago and the state of the art has evolved. So teams that, that uh, onboarded early, they had the best at that time. But then, as things have you, as you have new uh, new features and capabilities in Kubernetes, you need to be able to keep your installed base sort of up to date with those best practices. And that's been a challenge for us at Intuit. So that's another part of it. Another question? You had another question? Um, so that is the, that is the readiness gate. So the readiness gate is a fairly new Kubernetes feature. So they, they I mean, fairly new in the sense that in the last, you know, four or five releases. Um, so yeah, Kubernetes continues to sort of try to close some of these gaps and holes, but then it comes back to the earlier point of like, well, now you've got to go retrofit whatever was there before, right? To make sure that they have that. Um, so I think, so I can't think of any holes that are still existing, but that's not to say there's not, so.